You are listening to the Pioneer Growing Point Agronomy Podcast. Today we discuss sudden death syndrome and seed treatments for soybeans. I'm your co-host, DuPont Pioneer Field Agronomist, Brian Buck. With me as always is DuPont Pioneer Field Agronomist, Josh Schaffner. Josh, this is the episode one of 2017. Let's welcome back all of our listeners. Oh, absolutely. We also want to welcome any new listeners to the show uh, for episode one this year. I think we got a a great slate of shows coming here before kind of planting season starts. And obviously when we get to planting season, we'll kind of roll into current topics of the day. But uh, today we got a good topic, uh, talking sudden death syndrome in soybeans and seed treatments. I think, Brian, one of the, the hottest topics coming out of 2016 in soybeans was big yields, uh, but also probably sudden death syndrome being the, the management thing we want to take a closer look at uh, for the coming year. Yeah, every year it seems like there's one thing that we talk a lot about it in each crop, whether it's a disease or whatever it may be, an environmental factor. And uh, it was definitely sudden death syndrome for soybeans last year. Uh, pretty widespread across the area in southeast Minnesota. I didn't see it creep too much north of the Twin Cities area, but uh, for our listening area, a lot of growers were heavily impacted by it. Yeah, I'd say the I-90 corridor was probably the areas that got hit as hard as any. And and really look at the impact, you know, did it completely devastate soybean yields? No, uh, but certainly fields that maybe exhibited some some heavy levels of FCS were we're probably in the lower 50 bushel range where, where we didn't have SDS and everything was going good. We were probably upwards of, of high 60s to low 70s in some cases. And and really, Brian, I think the growing season, our conditions just favored SDS, almost just textbook. Yeah, so you think about some of the things that really do favor the disease. And, you know, first and foremost, I think lower poorly drained soils. You know, poorly drained soils is one thing, but we also had a ton of rainfall last year, which may may take a soil that does drain pretty good and make it a little wetter. Um, compacted areas of the fields, we saw a lot of it on the headlands, you know, and just areas that get a lot of traffic. Uh, early planting tends to favor it, and we did get in the ground really early last year. Um, so, you know, I think those are some of the biggest things we saw last year, and I think the environment we had really did match up uh, perfectly to have a little bit more disease pressure than we have historically with it. Yeah, and SDS, it uh, survives over winters in the soil. It's it's a disease, a uh, fungus that's not going to go away once it's here, Brian. In most cases, if you have a history of it in the field, uh, even crop rotation, you know, you think about sometimes, you know, white mold or some of the common diseases we deal with, we can maybe rotate to corn. But uh, with SDS, it, it's kind of a unique thing where rotation probably ain't going to be a big thing. But with that said, there are some really solid management practices that can help us overcome this challenge. Yeah, so you start thinking about managing it and, you know, we talked about some of those things like compaction being number one, you know, trying to limit compaction is good, fixing drainage uh, is important. Um, But really, I I think two of the biggest things for me are uh, variety selection first. So, you know, if you do have a a tough history with it or if you've had history with it, you know, looking at the varieties you're going to select and uh, choosing the right one with a higher SDS score is good. Uh, And the other thing that has come to the market recently uh, that can be a huge help is I leave all fungicide seed treatment. So uh, we have the variety selection option, but now we do have a seed treatment that works extremely well on it too. Yeah, and we're excited under our Pioneer Premium Seed Treatments, Brian Olivo is an offering that that's under that. And it's something we want to take a look at um, because obviously, you know, Brian, we've been looking at this seed treatment for a couple of years and, and trying to get a feel for it. And um, you think of, of sudden death syndrome and you think of the symptoms, you know, they really start to show up kind of that mid growing season in July and into August. It really starts to just see that leaf symptom. And you think about a seed treatment, well, I'm going to do something in planning. And commonly, Brian, when I think of seed treatment, you think of, okay, we're going to get 30 to 60 days protection. And you don't always think about seeing a massive visual uh, late season. But with Olivo and the way uh, the biology of, of sudden death syndrome is, that's kind of our best way to control it. Yeah. So you think about Olivo, it is a fungicide seed treatment, like we said. And, um, you know, a lot of growers might go out and think, well, I'm starting to get the leaf symptoms of SDS showing up right around that window where you could do a foliar fungicide on beans. But that isn't effective because the the disease itself actually colonizes and enters early through the roots in the season. And that's why that seed treatment is so effective is because we want to stop the infection from taking place early season, whether that be, you know, June or depending on when you planted your beans, just early, early on. By the time the leaf symptoms show up, it's too late. It's already infected and it's going to do its damage. Yeah. So ultimately, Brian, when you think of sudden death syndrome, when our planter leaves the field, our, our stage is set for SDS. There's nothing else we can do literally through the rest of the growing season. Right. So like we said, variety selection and the seed treatment option is really good. So looking at, you know, we have, we have, we do have some data on SD or on Olivo fungicide seed treatment that uh, we've done throughout the years and we've done a ton of work on it. And the increase that you can get in yield is really significant if you've had pressure. So it's one of those things, are you going to blanket it across every acre? 
probably not. But if you do have any kind of history of SDS, it is a really good option uh, to help control that. Yeah, and through our our pioneer growing point agronomy research, you know where we have uh, solid pressure of SDS, our location show that the seed treatment alone we're getting about a six point four bushel increase uh, by utilizing. Uh, a levo fungicide seed treatment. Other locations where we don't have as much SDS pressure, still seeing a two bushel increase. You know, the other thing, Brian, we, we talk about a levo, but a levo is a fungicide slash nematicide seed treatment. So in some cases, there are two rates there. And if we are dealing with some heavier pressure of cyst, we can still see some yield responses there. But ultimately, if we look at where should we use a levo fungicide seed treatment, where shouldn't we use, Brian? I think if we're just seeing some moderate to low symptoms, I think variety selection might be enough to get there. But if you dealt with some pretty heavy pressure uh, the past couple of years, I think that's where maybe taking a good variety and layering that with that C treatment is probably the ticket. Yeah, and it's amazing. You know, if you look at some of the side-by-sides we saw this year, uh, what you can do if you do do both, if you have a good variety with a good seed treatment, like I leave a fungicide seed treatment, uh, you can get some outstanding results compared to maybe being a little disappointed, you know, from not having that out there in a pressure situation. Yeah, so certainly, you know, just kind of reviewing SDS, it's been a disease, Brian, that, you know, I'd say last year was probably our prominent disease even more than white mold. The one thing that's really nice about SDS compared to other soybean diseases, Brian, is we have multiple ways we can manage it. We can try to manage our cyst pressure, lower that because they tend to go hand in hand. We can, you know, select varieties that have good tolerance to it, which there are a lot of varieties that manage it pretty well. We have seed treatment as an option. We can try to play with our planting dates. If we put all that together, you know, it it is a disease that I think we can manage in southern Minnesota and and really try to limit that that yield impact that we've seen the last couple of years. Yep, I would agree completely. And, you know, it's probably here to stay. We've seen it grow, I think, over the last year or two, last year kind of being its uh, biggest year or worst year we've seen yet. So, uh, like you said, crop rotation is not going to change it a ton. It can survive. If you do go to a couple years of corn, it can still survive on some of that residue. So, um, you know, looking long term, I think just be aware if you do get it. And then if, if you do have a start show up, you got to, you know, be proactive and manage it either with variety selection, uh, seed treatment, or both. You bet. Well, I think that's a good place to kind of kind of wrap up on our first episode here 2017. Brian, obviously just a quick plug. A good place to find our Pioneer Growing Point Agronomy podcast is via our Twitter feeds. Uh, I am at Josh Schaffner. And I am at Farmer Buck. Well, Brian, that's a wrap for episode one of 2017. This show is recorded from the Agronomy Bunker Studio in Zimbrota, Minnesota. It is produced by Brian Buck and Josh Schaffner. This is a bi-weekly podcast. Thanks for listening, and be sure to tune in next time.